Well, if you follow my videos, you've seen that I've made several on uh, Arco Wand central vacuums, the 1910s uh, roots blower type that is actually one of the most common brands. And my last video deconstructing the Arco Wand, I had the, uh, the bigger version of this one with a one horse motor and uh, it gave its life to science. It was never reconstructed. Um, the thing just wasn't in good shape and it was missing the original bucket. You know, I had that kitchen stock pot and a bungee cord holding it on. And so I said, eh, this, this just, you know, I, I need the space. Um, but uh, another machine has found me and last year I was given the opportunity to go and pick up this thing from Dayton, Ohio, from the Oakwood section of Dayton, Ohio, came out of a four square from about 1915. And this is the more common half horsepower size. And it has a Wagner built repulsion start motor. These uh, Arco One units, to my knowledge, all used a special 1165 RPM motor. Your, your regular old standard induction motor is 1725 RPM, and your, your turbine machines like the Tuek and the Spencer used 3600 RPM motors, or, or 3450 uh, is what they're actually rated for, and for higher speed. But these used a slow speed motor because these pumps ran that slow. They were direct connected. Um, the earliest Arco ones had a belt uh, drive and the, the motor was kind of mounted on a big hinged plate up here. And the earliest machines had two buckets also, one for, one for water to seal the pump. The pump would recirculate water through it and then the left one would be where the dirt went. The Arco one in the Wright Brothers house uh, has, is that style. But by like 1913 or so, they were at the point where they were just making the one bucket machine like that. And so that's what this one is. One other quick note on the motor. If you look at the horsepower rating, it's one half I-N-T-E-R. It's like a half horsepower, but not quite which to me kind of reminds me of if you ever look at a motor on an air compressor, you know, if it's rated for two horsepower, if you look, the motor will usually say horsepower two SPL, meaning BS basically. Um, so even though this is a physically big and heavy motor, apparently this isn't rated for true half horsepower and you can actually stall it out fairly easily, which I'll demonstrate. But like any repulsion start induction run motor, uh, the, the brushes contact the end face of the commutator and there's a centrifugal weight that when the motor is up to speed, the brushes are lifted and the machine runs as an induction motor. These can be reversed by just loosening a screw and moving the, the brush riding mechanism only about a quarter of an inch. But of course that would make the pump run in reverse too. So we, we leave it the way it is. It's ring oiled uh, sleeve bearing, nice, nice caps on the oil ports there. And I like to leave these machines wired the way they were. Um, so on any of these machines, you'll notice four wires and they can be arranged either in series for 240 volt operation or in parallel for 120. All of the ones that I've, uh, acquired have been wired for 240 so these two middle leads are just just connected together and uh, so I leave them that way because I've got the 240 volt outlet anyway I use I use just a piece of modern vinyl cord but friction tape over the conductors kind of makes it look a little bit more vintage and then of course I've attached a ground and this one is in the nicest shape I think I've ever seen one of these in for being all original. It is, it is a beautiful specimen. This came from a house where the basement obviously never got wet and the thing never was cannibalized because a lot of these, you'll find a lot of them where the, the pump is there on the base, but somebody took the motor and used it to make a, you know, a, a bench grinder or something. So the, they're motorless and it's kind of a special motor to try and find. But here's the nameplate. 
This is a Model 341. Last patent date is 1914. So this machine's probably from 15. Number 3680 that they built. I've got some oil leakage from the pump from just using it. These did kind of leak oil. Um, they're not as well sealed as, as maybe they could have been. Maybe if I found the leak, I could fix it. But, you know, just for occasionally running this, I don't know. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a roots type blower. So there are two lobes that interlock. They're geared together so that when on each revolution, they scoop out a definite quantity of air, a fairly small quantity. Um, but because they they move air every turn they make, they are known, uh, they're classified as positive displacement blowers rather than a turbine type, which can just run with no air flowing. You're supposed to oil in here and in there. And underneath this really neat flip up cover is the, the coupling and there is a note to oil the driving pins. And if you didn't, these would actually wear down and you'd have quite a bit of slop uh, between the pump and the motor. Beautiful, uh, beautiful decal. And like any vacuum cleaner of any type made during that period, they were required to buy a license from uh, David T. Kenny, who was the originator, uh, or at least the first guy to patent the basic concept of, of suction cleaning through a nozzle. Any manufacturer, whether it was Arco One, Spencer, uh, Hoover, until that patent expired, they had to buy a license from Kenny. And, uh, this has the original bucket on it. Very nice, very nice pivoting lock handle. You know, some of the other machines like Tuek and Spencer, for example, uh, they were they were more primitive than this. This is a nice, nice setup. And we have some very early dirt in here. One of the things I always enjoy trying to speculate is how long were these machines actually used for? Like. You know, was it 20 years, 30 years? Uh, a lot of times I think it was until the hose got to be nasty and crunchy and started to leak a lot of air and this thing didn't have any spare airflow that it could afford to lose. So, you know, by the 1930s or 40s, let's say, you could buy a, a nice canister vacuum and you'd say, well, heck with this thing because you couldn't find where to replace the hose anyway if you wanted to keep using it. One of the things some of this stuff is stuff that I've sucked up, but there are a couple of these prepaid state of Ohio sales tax stamps. And some quick searching online. I believe these were from the thirties, if I'm not mistaken. I thought there was another one in here. That one? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. Do I save those? Do I save the, the entire contents of the bucket here? All right, this is a bit tricky to do one-handed. handle's got to be up. Okay, so you start with the handle up and then as you as you lower the handle it pushes the bucket up into place. And this is the exact mechanism that a new Arco wand uses. Yes, you can buy a vacuum cleaner called Arco wand today. Uh, this it's not much related to the original company, but the uh, the American Vacuum Company, which is now in the northern suburbs of Chicago, is owned by a descendant of someone who 
was involved with this company that made these. And these were made in Rockford, Illinois, I believe. How did I know that? It says Chicago, Illinois here, but that's where American Radiator was headquartered. I thought these were made in Rockford. Well, that might be fake news, I'm sorry. Uh, but these were sold by plumbing and heating contractors and American Radiator was a big name in radiators and boilers. They made the ideal boilers and they later merged with Standard Sanitary that made plumbing fixtures and became American Standard. So the deal was when you were building a house, you, you, you were getting your a heating system put in no matter what. And the heating contractor would say, hey, you know, we've got this vacuum system that we can put in too. They, they would just run another set of iron pipes and sell you this machine, and, and that was it. And these were advertised. There's quite a few advertisements out there for, you know, saves the, saves the labor shortage and dust-free homes for brides, and they're, some of them are pretty neat. But anyway, uh, this was installed without an outside exhaust. They just put this, you know, four-foot length of inch-and-a-half cast iron on here with a part of a P-trap to blow the exhaust downward, and uh, it wasn't vented outside. But these were, of course, filtered. They had a, a big cloth filter inside here that, from the intake, there's a funnel. There's an upside-down funnel there, so it flares out, and the dirt goes just straight down and hits the bucket. And then the filter is, is cloth that's stretched from the bottom of that funnel up to the outer, uh, you know, the diameter of this inside. And so this is pulling from the clean side of the filter. It's kind of reminiscent of the casting on a Filtex central vacuum lid. But so from there, after it goes through the filter, which is really big, it gives a lot of surface area. And uh, even these, though these always have a hundred year accumulation of dirt on them, Cleaning the filter doesn't really make much difference. They, they gave you such big filtration area for the amount of air that needed to pass through it that it, it, was, it was good. But this is a relief valve, which will be set for, I believe, four inches of mercury. And uh, this relief valve is needed because of what I mentioned before, the blower is positive displacement. And if you don't have this, the blower will in fact um, continue to try and move air until the motor literally stalls out. So, okay, well I have it connected up here, so let's fire it up. We're gonna watch the motor start. Contrary to most vacuum cleaners that we're familiar with, when you put your hand on the end and block the suction, it does not speed up. It slows down a little bit. Because it's pulling harder, it's doing more work. You know, on a, on a centrifugal machine or a modern, any modern vacuum cleaner, when it's moving no air, it's drawing fewer amps. It's doing less work. And when it's moving the most air is when the current draw is greatest. Well, on a machine like this or any positive displacement, it's drawing more current the less air it's moving. Well, I've got my, my little poor man Spencer vacometer here, and I'll show you the performance that these had. These were made for inch and a half pipe one inch hose and tools with a with a very narrow opening in order to concentrate the suction and give you decent velocity with what little airflow you had. And so
Our relief valve is opening at about 75 inches. And the standard Spencer performance test showed that for hard floor cleaning, your, your bare floor brush was equivalent to a 7 8 orifice. So at a 7 8 orifice, we have 10. And this is 10 of water column, by the way, not of mercury. And the carpet cleaning tool was equivalent to a 5 8 or the arcos were a little smaller, so maybe we'll try a half. So at a 5 8 we have just almost 20. And we have about 45 and a half inch. So <clears throat> it's not moving a lot of air, but if you were using this machine with narrow tools, you could pick up dirt. You know, I'll put a, I've got a crevice tool handy and I'll just shove that in there. Okay. So that's the uh, that's the machine. So by modern standards, the suction is not very impressive, but it was still a heck of a lot better than any portable vacuum you could get at the time, and it was it was uh, way 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 better than not having a vacuum cleaner at all. And and you could get your house clean with it. You could you know, it would get the job done, but it quickly became insufficient when you had a frame of reference when you compared it to a you know a a more advanced portable vacuum cleaner it, it just was like mm, this thing this thing doesn't have any suction especially once it was old enough that the hose started to go bad because just like you know the cloth hoses on portable vacuums all the way up until the 60s uh, these were a canvas and rubber hose and the rubber inside just deteriorated and then the thing would would lose what little performance it had. But, oh, I can show you how the pump stalls out. I'm gonna put my hand over the exhaust after the thing's running just momentarily and I'll show you what it does. It's kind of weird. Okay, so I could either do this and then pull the relief valve, but I only have one hand. So by obstructing the exhaust, If I keep doing that, the motor does actually stall. Of course, that's not very good for the thing, but um, funny machines. And this example is, is so well preserved and works perfectly. And, and so I just wanted to share that with you. And uh, oh, one last thing. This is getting to be a long video. We're at almost 20 minutes, but I forgot to mention that in here, after the relief valve, inside this, you know, you can tell this isn't just an elbow. There's something in here. It is a check valve. It's a flapper that only allows the air to flow one way. And Arco provided instructions about how to clean the pump. And what they said was, if you... If you run the machine closed for just a few seconds and let the air build and you know, let the pressure build, and then you push on this, it'll relieve the pressure. You know, you hear a little psh, and that momentary little puff of air through the, through the other side of the filter, you know, going the wrong way, would tend to knock the dust off the filter. And that was what they said to do. But anyway, there's the Arco One 341. Thank you for watching.